Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John DeYard. Welcome to the Lifestyle Podcast. And today we have a really special guest. His name is Steven Sashan. He is the owner and founder of a company called Zero Shoes. And that's what we're going to talk about, is running, uh, the biomechanics of running, uh, minimalist running, barefoot running, and how he created a company that allows you to wear an amazing shoe that gives you the benefit of barefoot running. Just an amazing topic. Let me talk a little bit about him. He's the founder, he's the co-founder uh, and CEO of a company called Zero Shoes with his wife, Lena Phoenix. Uh, like I said, he's an all-American uh, gymnast. He's a also an all-American master sprinter, so he's still running at top speeds. Um, he appeared on Shark Tank and turned down an offer with Shark Tank and blew up his company anyway. His company's doing amazing around the world. Uh, I love this company. I love this topic. Stephen, welcome. So great to have you here. Um, you know, um, my first question to you is, I, I met you, gosh, I don't even know when, 20 years ago, uh, when I first got well, the little uh, rubber yeah. Karachis, you know? Yeah, 1930-something, um, 19, early 40s, somewhere around there. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I, I probably, probably 12 ish years ago went, cause we started the company with just a do it yourself sandal making kit based right. on a 2000 year old, you know, design idea. And that's when we probably connected. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I got that kit actually. Right. Right. I remember that. That was amazing. And then since then, I mean, that was just a, a piece of rubber with some string around it to create like a sandal that you would run with, which was actually really amazing. And then, um, and then tell us how it grew to how many shoes do you have now in your on your line? Well, let's just say it's inconceivable to me as well. So I think right now there's 52 different styles of casual and performance shoes, boots and sandals. And it happened mostly because we started with this do-it-yourself kit. Frankly, it started almost as a joke. I mean, I was making sandals for people as a little hobby. Someone suggested I that if I built a website for this goofy hobby of mine, he could put me in a book that he was writing. And I thought that was a great idea, an incredible opportunity. I built hundreds of websites, so it was going to be easy. I rush home. I pitch this amazing opportunity to my wife, who tells me I'm a complete idiot and I it won't make any money and it's a waste of time. So she insisted that I not build a website. I told her I wouldn't. And then she went to bed and I did. So, um, so that's how it started. And then what happened very quickly is people would just tell us what they wanted next. Like, hey, I love this sandal idea, but I'm not going to make my own. Can you find a way to make it ready to wear? That took us three years. And then what am I going to do when it's winter? I have to go to the office. So we made our first closed toe shoe, which only came out just shy of uh, yeah, yeah, um, seven years ago, 20, yeah, seven years ago. And then again, you know, what? well, I need a running shoe. Then I need a trail running shoe. Then I need a fill in the blank. And we also have a really smart product team. So we could see some of the opportunities that people weren't asking about that we could tell were there. Um, but really, it's just been organic. And half of our customers or half of our business is returning customers. Once you get used to wearing something that lets your feet do what's natural, that's not squeezing your toes and doesn't mess with your posture and gives you that ground feeling that your brain needs, um, people get kind of addicted. So we have people who own 20, 30 pairs of our shoes. I mean, it's outrageous. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, the internet's a big part of it as well in a weird way, because people just assume that if you're online, you can act just like a multi-billion dollar company. So we've had people saying, why don't you have a store in Kuwait? Or why don't you have a store in North Korea? Um, and, yeah. uh, so we've, we have tried to grow as much as we can given financial restraints. We don't have a whole lot of, we don't have, you know, billions of dollars behind us. Uh, so we try to grow as fast as we can to just accommodate people who've been begging us to grow even faster. So you went on Shark Tank and yeah. I don't think anybody turns down an offer to Shark Tank. So <laughs> tell, tell us that story real quick. Um, no, it happens. So when we had the opportunity to get on the show, we interviewed People who had bought shoe companies, people who had sold shoe companies, people who had invested in shoe companies, uh, just like everyone we could think of. And they gave us a valuation range. And we uh, knew that uh, when you get on the show, they want to talk you down. They want to, well, let's call it negotiating, but that's really not what it is. So we had to pick a number that we felt really represented what the potential of the business was, wasn't insane based on the expert opinions that we had, but would give them some room to talk us down. So we offered 8% of the company for $400,000, which is a $5 million valuation. 
And Kevin came back and said, I'll give you the 400 grand for 50% of the company. And we said, um, wow. no. And he said, well, you can make a counter offer. I said, well, how about, you know, I'll give you a 20% better and make it 10% for 400. He goes, ah, you're crazy. I went, eh, maybe, but um, I didn't think so. I mean, he was basically offering us mm, at that valuation, it would have been less than the amount of money we were going to make that year, which makes no sense for a company that was growing as fast as ours. Yeah. And then did I read that after Shark Tank that some other investor came along and, and helped you guys get kind of boosted you in, in a different oh, way? Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> so, no. Um, the thing that happened after Shark Tank when it aired is we end up we ended up making about three months worth of revenue in the week following the show, which is, an, here's the thing. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back when I say this, but it's a weird thing for me to think about. The amount of money that I'm talking about that we made in that period is about what we make in a day and a half now. So three months worth of sales then is a day and a half now. So, which is wow. just outrageous. But um, uh, no, no one came knocking at the door. In fact, quite the opposite. People would, well, half the opposite. People would come up and approach us and they they just kept saying it's like they'd say they were interested and then say no like we try frankly we tried to sell this company from day one we thought it would be something where we could just get it going get it rolling somebody would want to take it on because lane and i both knew how much money we needed to retire and the answer is not very much so we tried to sell the company when we were at a million in sales and no one would say yes and then two and then five and then ten people kept moving the goalposts they kept saying, well, wait till you get to fill in the blank. And I go, well, we'll be there next year. They go, eh, we don't think so. Then we would get there next year. And they'd say, well, you know, what about, you know, next year? So we didn't take any, the, the first money we took in a way was in 2017, we did an equity crowdfunding raise. Lena and I are um, somewhat socialistic at heart. We think it's a little silly that only rich people can get richer and that people who are supporting a business like ours can't participate in the growth. So we did an equity crowdfunding raise. Um, letting anybody invest in the company. And we raised a little over a million dollars. This was in 2017. And then uh, in 20, the end of 2020, so after, as COVID was kind of midstream, after supply chain issues, after trade war issues, uh, finding the money that we needed to keep growing the company to buy the amount of inventory we needed the next year was getting harder and harder. And we got approached by a private equity firm uh, and we took a made a deal with them back in 2020. That was very helpful because of the cash, but also because they helped us find the kind of uh, talent we needed to help grow the company from where we were then, which is about, I don't know, 20 million in sales to you know much greater than that. Well, what an incredible story. Well, I I, uh, I want to thank you for sending me these shoes. I love them. They're, they are called the Scrambler Mid. They're kind of a hiking shoe. I the last zero shoe I had was the little Hirachi with the with the you know, that's the last one that I've had, and um, I got to tell you I love those and uh, these are amazing. They feel like I, I I went for a run, I went for a hiking, and I felt like I was wearing moccasins. You yeah. know, I felt like I was. A, it felt so cool to be in a shoe that was super lightweight that felt like my finger my my toes were like I felt like a little. I don't know, weirdly like a cat. Like I felt that yeah. kind of like connection to the ground, you know? So I want you to maybe share with us, you know, the mechanics of why this is different and what makes it better and why people should think about a zero shoe. Well, everything we do has the same DNA, even though we have, again, 50 different kinds of products from uh, sandals, shoes, boots, they're all based on a couple of simple ideas. You've got a quarter of the bones of your whole body and your feet and ankles that and joints as well, obviously, not just single bones. Otherwise, you couldn't move very well. But with all those bones and joints, that's to let your feet bend and flex and move. That's for balance, agility, and mobility. So we want to let your feet do that. We want to make sure the toe box in the shoes is wide enough so your toes aren't getting squeezed together. So you can actually use those digits at the end of your feet that are at the end of your legs. Um, you have more nerve endings in the soles of your feet than anywhere but your fingertips and lips. That's so your brain knows what you're stepping on or in. So it can then tell your body how to move appropriately on the train that you're on. So everything we make is designed to let your feet do their job so the rest of your body can do its job. Because if you squeeze your toes together, if you elevate your heel, if you put a bunch of cushioning under there so you can't feel the ground, what happens is all the function that your feet are trying to do that they can't do, it tries to move upstream. It doesn't work, but it tries to move into your ankle, your knee, your hip, and your back. And they aren't wired for balance, agility, mobility, let alone that kind of ground feel that you need. 
And that's what can cause back pain, hip pain, knee pain, et cetera. So we want your feet to do their job, let your body do its job. And then, oh, we make things super, super lightweight. That's another important thing. We've had people say that they went to bed still wearing our shoes because they forgot they had them on, which is very <laughs> entertaining. Um, and we also want to make them durable. Just a quick, you know, quick mm, political diatribe or semi-political diatribe. Um, there are a lot of companies in the footwear and apparel business who are talking about how they're so environmentally friendly. And I'm here to let you know that it's just complete nonsense. That there's not, there are no products that are really used used in footwear and apparel that are providing a real benefit to the uh, the um, uh, ecosystem. So, uh, you know, the, those materials, they actually take more energy to process or they take more energy to manufacture or they just cost more or they're not as durable. So more stuff ends up in landfills. So our thing is we want to use the best materials we can, knowing that they are evolving and just make things longer lasting. So our soles, in most running shoes, they say you need to replace them because the sole will wear out in two to 400 miles. We make our soles with a different uh, material. And so we back them with a 5,000 mile sole warranty. Now that doesn't guarantee they're gonna last 5,000 miles. If you're starting and stopping your car like Fred Flintstone with your feet, then you're gonna wear things out. But what we have, if they do wear out faster than we think they should, um, then you can replace them for you know pennies on the dollar, which is something no other company that we're aware of does. Wow, that's amazing. So, so you know the whole barefoot running thing and the minimalist thing was huge. What was that? Ten years ago, maybe. Well, and yes and no. And okay. the yes is it was in two thousand nine when it really peaked. The interest really peaked then but right now there's actually more interest than there was then so there was a big peak in 2009 after the book born to run came out right. um, and some research about how if you're running barefoot which by the way i'm not going to tell people to run barefoot even though it changed my life um, but there was research showing that if you're running barefoot rather than in running shoes you're putting less strain on your joints less force into your joints it's better for you in short so that was when it peaked then and then there was a dip it never um, fell apart the way people imagined that it did in fact the dip was mostly in the interest that you're seeing in terms of search on the internet. But for the companies like ours who were, who survived that time, or I don't know what that means, who were in, in, in the business at that time, we've all continued to grow nonstop. So it never fell apart the way people imagine. But the, mm. if you look at the search volume for barefoot shoes, you can do this in a thing called Google trends. You can look at how many people have searched for barefoot shoes in any area worldwide, U S whatever you want. It's at a peak now. It's never been higher. And the most recent growth has been totally organic. So uh, big, big interest then, more and more now for a number of reasons. And we're, I mean, I, I say we're seeing the benefits that I, I have to be a little less um, humble about it. We're part of why that happened. I mean, we've been really pushing hard to make people aware of what we do. And so we were part of creating that organic growth. But again, the biggest thing that has that sells our product is the experience of our product. Half of our orders coming from existing customers. And I, I did a poll recently. I said, how many people have stopped you on the street uh, to just say, hey, what are those shoes? And it was um, it was like 75%. I said, how many people have stopped you on the street and they knew that those were zero shoes? And they said, that was about 65%. I said, how many people just stopped you on the street because they were also wearing zero shoes? That was like 50%. So the amount of awareness that we have for a company our size is a little out, out of proportion. So clearly, though, we've been helping you know, grow this interest, which is good. But what sustains it is the experience people have when they let their feet and body do what they're made to do. I'm not sure if it's, if it's just like you said, well, I'm not sure what happened, but you know, a lot of folks think based on at least in, in my world, some of those studies that came out where they had runners in, in like uh, army boots and they would run and they had them compared to people in running shoes and the and the folks in the army boots with all the support, it lasted longer, they didn't have as many injuries. And, there, and the word was out that, that barefoot running just caused a whole host of in, injuries, which is why you don't see them in the shoe stores anymore. Yeah, let me let me do this. <clears throat> so, um, sorry, I had a oh, bit of Yeah, so um, here's what actually happened. If you look at those studies, uh, they were at best badly done, but also just frankly not true. So um, 
So where to begin? So there was a lot of, there was doctors back then saying, oh my God, I love this barefoot thing. I'm getting more patients than ever before. I go, well, there's just more people trying something than ever before. So that's going to make a change. Look, the number one cause of injuries right now is pickleball, but no one's saying they should ban pickleball or that pickleball is bad. They're saying, oh, there's something about your body that maybe, you know, you need to adjust first before you start playing pickleball. But in the footwear world where big companies have convinced you that the shoe is magic, you just put it on and suddenly you can leap tall buildings in a single bound uh, or your mortgage rate will go down and your kids will get into a better college, whatever they say. Um, it's just not the case. So what I say to these doctors is, first of all, there's just more people doing something. So maybe you're just getting a bigger population of people who are trying something different. Secondly, you guys said the same thing back in 1972 when the running, new running shoes came out. You were making the exact same claim because there was more people getting injured because there was more people trying some new thing. Third, we're the first ones to say, this has nothing to do with the shoes. It's all about form. It's all about biomechanics. And so have you look, taken a look at their running form? Have you done video analysis? And do you even know how to do video analysis? And they go, uh, no. I could. Oh, and by the way, the people who have a great time, who make the transition and, they, and their injuries go away, their problems go away, they don't come to see you because they don't need to see a doctor. They stop going to doctors. And then some of the actual research, there was a, a researcher here in Colorado who did a study to try to demonstrate that you needed the cushioning under your shoes more than being barefoot. And he says in the study that he used accomplished barefoot runners in the study. Well, I accused him uh, accurately over a beer one night. I said, uh, I know all the barefoot runners in town. I am one of the barefoot runners in town. Neither I nor anyone that I know has been in your lab. I know the people that were in your lab. They weren't accomplished barefoot runners. They were accomplished runners who do a little bit of training at the end of their workout on the grass and bare feet. Whole different story. So it's about the form, not the footwear. It's just the issue is that footwear can get in the way of or can facilitate proper form. So if you have a big elevated heel, that gets in the way of proper form. If you're squeezing your toes together, that gets in the way of proper form. If you have a whole bunch of cushioning, that gets in the way of proper form. All the things built into a modern athletic shoe, literally, and I know this sounds like I'm you know, a conspiracy theorist, but this one's true. All the things in a modern running shoe get in the way of letting you run the way humans have been running for 99.95% of human history. And Dr. Irene Davis at Harvard, she demonstrated this repeatedly. Dr. Bill Sands, the former head of the U.S. Olympic Biomechanics for the U.S. Olympic Committee, demonstrated this repeatedly by having people come into their lab. They have all sorts of problems. And those two doctors say, take off your shoes and see what happens. 90% of people are better instantly. Not that their injuries you know, clear up instantly, but their form changes instantly and improves instantly. And the 10% for whom it doesn't, you give them five minutes of instruction and then they do too. Because in short, running in bare feet, bad form hurts, good form feels good. And if you give yourself just enough time to try to figure out how do I change what I'm doing so I'm not hurting myself, then you end up adopting the form that human beings have been using for running since the beginning of human beings. So from a therapeutic point of view, um, do you have any science or studies show that when people shift from you know a regular running shoe to these running shoes that they're as our fasciitis goes away, their issues go away. Yeah, I'll do one better. Um, I'm going to let people <clears throat> off the hook and say, if you're happy running in your shoes, whatever they are, keep doing it. But add something. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's research from Dr. Isabel Sacco where she took, uh, I think it was about 200 and something runners. Half of them did an eight-week foot exercise program and the other half did not. Over the course of the year-long study, the runners, again, in regular shoes, whatever they were wearing, the runners who did the exercise program had 250% fewer injuries than the runners who did not do the exercise program. Now, even though you can do this exercise program in minutes a day while you're watching TV, I know most people won't do it. And by the way, I'll tell you where I give it away for free. Um, but there's an even better study that for people who think they're going to do an exercise program and probably aren't. There's research from Dr. Sarah Ridge showing if all you do is walk in a pair of shoes like ours, you'll get the same benefits as that exercise program. Your feet will get stronger as if you did an exercise program. So I will concede, because I'm a very science-minded person, that there isn't a study yet showing that if you just walk in our shoes for building strength, for active recovery, et cetera, you will then reduce your injury risk over time. <clears throat> Pardon me, but do the math. Walk in our shoes, it builds strength as much as the exercise program that's shown to reduce injuries. So if that makes sense, that makes sense. Now that said, there's more and more research coming out every 
I don't say every day, every week, every month about the benefits of natural movement. And again, let's be clear, it's about letting your body do its natural more than it is about the footwear. And the reason that it's taken till now is in the early days, uh, you know, re good research costs a bunch of money. And we were all tiny little companies. We didn't have the cash to put it up. And the big companies, they weren't going to do it because they actually know the answer. I've had, we have had executive level people at multi-billion dollar footwear brands say to a friend of ours who was looking to invest, he, they said, um, oh, we know this natural movement thing is real. But if we did that, we'd be admitting we've been lying for 50 years. Mm. And by the way, the proof that they've been lying for 50 years, I'm going to quote their own research before I come back to answering your question. On the Nike website, they actually have an, a partial abstract of a study they did. They never published this entire study for reasons that might become obvious. And they only published a portion of the synopsis of the abstract. And what it showed is in a study they did where they were comparing their best-selling running shoe to a new shoe they developed, the way they publicized the results was the new shoe reduced injury rates by 52% over 12 weeks. But then you look at the numbers on their website. The best-selling running shoe in 12 weeks injured over 30% of the people wearing it. The new shoe injured, quote, only 14.5%. Now, imagine going to a running shoe store and you say, I'm looking for a really good shoe. And they go, here's our best seller. One out of three people get injured wearing this in about 12 weeks. It's like, oh, uh, do you have anything better than that. Yeah, here's one. Um, only one out of seven people get injured in 12 weeks. It's like, do you have one that doesn't injure people? <laughs> They're like, no, we're a running shoe store. So if you, th the amazing part is that, frankly, if I made footwear that injured between 14 and a half and 30.3% of the people wearing it in under 12 weeks, we'd be out of business and I would probably be in jail. And if that's the <laughs> best they can do after 50 years of research and development, we got a problem. But then the other question is, if that first shoe is so bad and the other shoe is so good, why are you still making that first shoe? To this day, Nike only makes two shoes that are similarly designed. And the question then becomes, what they do to that shoe to make it better? And this is the part of the abstract they didn't publish. Quote, they removed many of the protective features. They made it more like us, but not far enough. So that should say more than, you know, where's the study to back up what we're doing? We're not the intervention. Remember, what we're doing is what human beings have been doing for 99.95% of human history. The modern running shoe, 50 years old, that's the intervention. Where's the proof that that's better in terms of reducing injury or improving performance? And people will say, oh, well, you know, the shoes make people run faster. Well, here's the fun part about that. Um, I'll just do one example, but there are many. The world record in the 100-yard dash was set in 1971 and still stands, frankly, because they stopped running yards, they went to meters. But it was done in 1971 by a doctor named Delano Merriweather, amazing guy, really, really interesting. He ran a 9.0-second 100-yard dash. Now, if you're a sprinter, you may go, oh my gosh, because you'll know that translates to about a 9.8-second 100-meter dash. Now, he was wearing shoes that looked like ours on a mediocre track surface. The importance of that 9.800 meters, that would make him the fastest man in the world today. Not ever, but this year, that would make, I think that's the fastest anyone's run. Wow. So what have the shoes done for us? Nothing. <laughs> and arguably, what's made a bigger difference than shoes is track surfaces over time. So track surfaces have changed dramatically. Shoes, not so much. So um, anyway... Back to your question. Um, there is research showing that wearing shoes like ours improves dynamic stability in as little as four weeks. There's research going on now that the CDC is sponsoring on research about balance in the elderly. There's research from a number of places, including people uh, connected to the American College of Sports Medicine on plantar fasciitis and the reduction thereof. Um, there is research back to Isabel Sacco from Brazil showing that elderly women who had knee osteoarthritis after they just walked around in minimalist footwear for, I think, six months, their knee osteoarthritis and pain was either reduced in extremely uh, significantly or gone entirely just from getting out of shoes that, again, give you form that takes your feet out of the equation and puts force up into your joints instead of using your muscles, ligaments, and tendons properly. Um, there's, oh boy, I'm remembering more. There is a bunch of research again showing that just wearing shoes like these builds strength. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the other stuff that you asked about. 
Um, the hip pain, back pain thing. Well, there's postural stuff. That one's easy that when you wear a shoe that elevates your heel, even just a few millimeters, that changes your posture. You have to adjust with your knees, your hips, or your back. Um, there's research that we're starting to look into about performance, about what happens if you're a basketball player, for example, and you're wearing a typical basketball shoe, how stable is that when you're landing on it to jump or coming down from a rebound and how much energy is that foam sucking out of your system? Because all foam sucks energy out of the system. Shoe companies use a term called energy return. There's no such thing. There's just how much energy you lose because of the foam. And there's now research that's come out showing that the big, thick maximalist shoes are have the they suck the most energy out um, of the system for almost everybody, unless you're a particular weight running at a particular speed, which I guarantee no one listening to this call is. So, you know, and because you'd have to be an Olympian basically, and maybe there's some Olympians listening, I don't know. But if you're not, and this is kind of like trampolines, trampolines are tuned to a weight and speed. And what makes them work is your legs. Same thing with uh, with shoes, with foam. In fact, Elliot Kipchoge, the guy who ran the sub two hour marathon, uh, Nike was publicizing it. That it was all about their magic shoes. He came out a little while later and the article, the articles about him, he was saying, it was my legs doing the running, not the shoes. And that has proven to be true as well. So, so anyway. you say, explain how the the foam actually takes energy away. Are you talking about that that you have to just take more energy to push through the foam and and that? Oh, well, just just imagine uh, if you have a memory foam mattress. Just which would you rather do? Try and do jumping jacks on that or on the floor? All foam, right. just you know, it, it basically it absorbs energy and it doesn't give it back. I mean, the, this energy return idea is how much it can give you something right. back, but it never gives you more. And it never even gives you hundred percent. In fact, here, look, I'll do this one. This is the world's fastest uh, visual physics lesson. So um, Adidas came out with a product called Boost Foam. And the way they showed how cool it was, was they took like a, what looked like about a two pound steel ball. They bounced it off some concrete. It bounced, you know, once or twice, barely. They bounced it off, quote, the other company's foam. No other company used that foam, but that's okay. It bounced a few times a little higher than the concrete. Then they bounced it off the Boost Foam. Now the first bounce came up about 30% of the height that they dropped it from. And then it bounced about 10 more times. So here's the fun physics part. If you go to the Exploratorium Museum in San Francisco, which is a hands-on experiential museum, they have an exhibit where you can drop a steel ball through a plexiglass plate with a hole in it, and the ball hits a steel plate with concrete underneath it. The first bounce, again, off the boost foam, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a physics quiz. The first bounce off the boost foam bounces 30% from the height of that you dropped it from. So with this thing, steel ball dropping onto a steel plate with concrete underneath it, how high do you think the first bounce is? What percentage that you dropped it from does it bounce back up to? Probably almost 100%. 99%. It hits the plexiglass. And then it bounces about 260 more times. So um, the big companies, they just lie about what foam does. What foam? Here's what foam does and the reason people like it. It's comfortable. <laughs> It feels good when you're standing on it, just like sitting on a mattress, a you know, memory foam mattress or lying down a memory foam mattress feels good. But you know that if you lie on it long enough, all your muscles atrophy and you can't move. And you know that, you know, if you're going to try and jump rope, you're going to want to do it on the ground and not on a memory foam mattress. So what foam actually does, it spreads the pressure out so your feet don't feel what's happening but the force is still going into your body. And if you're landing on your heel when you walk or run and your leg is relatively straight, that force bypasses your muscles, ligaments, and tendons and goes right into your joints, your ankle, your knee, your hip, and your back. And here's another um, uh, image to use to understand the difference between pressure and force. Remember the, the video? It was one of the first movies ever made of this big fat guy standing basically in front of like a trampoline behind him that's vertical. And then he gets uh, shot with a cannonball have you remember this thing? No, mm. I gotta look it up. Just look up, Keep you know, going. Fat, fat guy cannonball. You'll probably found it. What happens is, I mean, this guy weighs like 400 plus pounds and he takes a cannonball right to the gut and it's in slow motion. And you see the ripples of fat just, you know, rippling, like dropping a stone into the water. So that's the pressure getting spread out. The force sends this 400 plus pound guy flying in the air into the trampoline thing behind him. That's what's happening in your feet and legs when you have a bunch of cushioning in your in your shoe. The pressure gets spread out. You don't feel as much. There's little ripples. The force goes into your joints and sends you, you know, not flying because it's not a cannonball, but same idea. <laughs> My daughter runs uh, 
she's a college track athlete, she's a hurdler. And uh, they're all, you know, aff affected by the latest, greatest track shoe and, and yeah. spikes. And they have now the ones that actually have a spring that makes you, you know, go so much faster. Nope. Nope. She's nope. Nope. Pause. She's, Pause. Hang on a, no hang on such a thing. Let me, let me finish my question real okay. quick. So Sorry, she's got, cause I want to go into this a little bit more deeply with track athletes and on, on the track, what happens. And my daughter yeah. ends up with a whole host of foot injuries. Um, right. She's still battling with. And uh, so I wonder what your take is on those shoes and Jesus. the, you know, what can the impact of the track and, what you can yeah. tell you, I know you can talk a lot about that. Yeah, let's just start with a simple thing. This whole thing that you know, running is running is inherently painful because of the impact. Again, and you have to pardon me for saying it again, but this whole idea that running is inherently difficult because of the impact forces is complete bullshit. Um, and the reason I say that is because of the research. <laughs> and so our bodies are wired to be able to handle the impact of sprinting, which is more impact than anyone is doing in any other kind of type of running. If you're an average runner, let's say you weigh 150 pounds and you're running at a you know, normal clip for an average decent runner, you hit the ground with about 400 to 500 pounds of force. A sprinter who weighs 150 pounds is hitting the ground with 700 to 1,000 pounds of force. So if we can tolerate it, why can't you? And people will say, well, but you're not doing as much. It's like, no, no, you're missing the point. This is the kind of thing that if someone just hit your foot with 1,000 pounds of force, you wouldn't be able to handle it. Why can sprinters handle it? Why can anyone running fast handle it? Because your muscles, ligaments, and tendons are designed to handle that when they're used correctly. So first of all, back to the idea that her shoes have springs that make them run faster. There's no such thing as, a, as anything that puts more energy back into the system. There's things that just suck less, but nothing puts more in. Nothing makes you go faster. I mean, this has been proven repeatedly. It's just not possible. Sprinting spikes are flat and hard and have almost no cushioning at all because that's what makes you run faster. Sprinters don't get the kind of injuries that people are talking about when they're middle distance runners, et cetera. When, you're in, when you have something that's foam, and let me say it this way, anything that is trying to mitigate force under your foot is doomed to fail because it is gonna do two things. It's gonna make you wobbly when you land or take off, and it's not gonna absorb the right amount, of, and it's gonna be absorbing force instead of letting you get it back. It's just Newton physics, Newtonian physics 101. So we've seen, and the other thing that, that it allows you to do is with any kind of cushioning or anything that's quote shock absorbing, it's reducing the amount of feedback that your foot is getting and your brain is getting. And the first part is your foot because what your foot is doing is sending information to your spinal cord, to the base of your spine, which comes back down into the muscles that need to activate to move properly. Then there's a higher level thing that goes to your brain and back. But the first thing is practically reflexive. If you're not getting that reflexive information quickly enough, that's what causes injuries. So I have a spinal problem. I've got a, basically a broken spine. And in the early days when I was running in regular shoes, I could literally almost feel that the, the muscles weren't getting the right neurological signal at the right time. And that was leading to nothing but injuries. When I got back into sprinting at 45, I had two years of almost nonstop injuries until I got out of my shoes. And I basically haven't had one since. And for a sprinter to go uninjured for the last 14 years is unheard of because I'm just never in a shoe that reduces my strength, reduces my mobility, reduces the feedback and weighs too much and messes with my posture. So, um, so I'm not surprised to hear that at all. In fact, back to the Nike study, it's been common knowledge that runners in uh, runners, like decent runners, uh, about 50% of them get injured every year. Marathon runners, almost 80% every year. And the Nike study essentially proves that because that 15 or 14 and a half to 30%, that's just in 12 weeks. Injury rates continue to go up over time. And so again, the question is, what are you guys doing that clearly isn't working? But even back to you know what you said, the new great thing, I'm, I'm a former nationally ranked athlete. Well, I'm still a nationally ranked athlete, um, but I've been a nationally ranked athlete since I was you know, 14. And what I can tell you is when you're at that level of competition, anything that you think might give you an advantage, you're going to try. If right. someone next to you tries some new thing and he beats you, guess what you're going to do the next day? You're going to get that thing. And so there's just a lot of superstition and a lot of mythology. I'll tell you, that Nike's quote, super spike. Um, everyone that I know who wears it says the same thing. When you're coming out of the blocks and just getting to full speed, it feels squishy and unstable. 
because it is, because it's squishy and unstable, as is anything that you put under your feet that's going to you know be absorbing some shock. And then what they say is in, in the middle of the run, it feels like I'm still moving faster. And he, this is a fun one. So Nike has a number of products that do this. And they will actually say in their advertising, gives you the feeling of propelling you forward. So right. in one of their big, thick maximalist shoes, I tried one on. It does give you that feeling because here's what happens. As your heel is coming off the ground at one speed, the foam underneath your heel is expanding back to normal or close to normal faster than your heel is moving. So the foam hits you in the heel. So it feels like something's happening, but nothing's happening because when your heel's off the ground, there's nothing you can do to change what your foot is doing with something that's hitting your heel. And here's the, the uh, again, I'm going to get a little technical. If any of these things worked, you could see it on a force plate. A force plate is literally showing how much force you're applying to the ground during the different phases of, of running. When your foot just touches the ground, when you're sort of mid stance, when your foot is coming off the ground. And basically it's a bell curve. It's a beautiful bell curve. The force, um, well, I take it back. If you're in a regular running shoe, landing on your heel, there's a spike of force initially, and then a bell curve. And that spike of force is what many people think, and the speed of that spike is what many people think is causing all sorts of injuries for runners. Barefoot runners don't have that spike. It goes away. And people in our shoes, same thing. So what happens is you see this very gradual increasing of force until you get to mid stance where you're having the maximum amount of force because the your body is just straight over your foot, which is on the ground. And then the force slowly, pardon me, slowly dissipates as your foot comes off the ground. If any of these things that whatever shoe company is making made an actual difference, you'd see it in the force plate data. You'd see that after mid stance, the speed you're getting off the ground is faster, for example, or the amount of force you're applying in different places, you know, is just changed in some way. But there's a reason you never see that force plate data because nothing changes, except it could get worse because you're on the ground longer because the foam is sucking energy out of your system. Wow. Okay, I so, I have, much, so... It, it's part of, you have to, part of, one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning is I hate when people lie to make money from their customers. And the simple thing is big shoe companies have been lying for 50 years. And you can, you can, it's in the data. I mean, it's just screamingly obvious. I, I, I sometimes joke that I want to go when I'm doing panel discussions at like the American College of Sports Medicine, where I want to say, here's, um, I printed out like double sided, single spaced, tiny little font, all the research showing the benefits of natural mo motion, getting out of regular shoes. And it's a big stack. Now, here's a stack showing all the problems that running shoes actually cause. It's an equally big stack. Now, let me pull out the stack showing the benefits of the modern athletic shoe for running in terms of injury and performance. And then I'm just going to look around and go, ah, yeah, I didn't bring it because there isn't one. There isn't one. Wow. Okay, so Stephen, so every, first of all, everyone, if you're listening to this and you're intrigued, uh, you can go to the link below and you can kind of check it out his website and look at all the different 50 shoes that he has and <laughs> pick the one that you like. It's really hard to pick. Trust me, I stayed on his website for quite a long time. It's very, very difficult. The shoes are all beautiful. Uh, and when you get them, they really do feel quite different. So back to track for a second. Um, Track spikes are super narrow. We've been trying, I'm trying to find a, a, a track spike for my daughter has a wide toe box. They don't well, exist. Well, they don't not, exist. well, not yet. Hint, what, hint. What, are you making one? Because I'm just trying to think of what, what my daughter can do. Because this is her life. She lives and breathes track. And Here's, she can't find the shoe that's working. She's got foot issues. Yeah. So, um, uh, in fact, when I got back into sprinting and I said, you know, how do I get by a track spike? They go, just buy something like a size too small. So it's like binding your foot and you can't move. And I went, that can't be right. So, um, we are working on one that in addition to being letting your foot do what's natural, uh, it will be the lightest spike ever made because we're using some technology that no one's thought to use before. Um, we are getting rid of the spikes in a way that actually gives you better traction and better grip on a modern track surface. There's no shoe that's been developed for a modern track surface. Spikes came from cinder tracks, so they just made them smaller. And then there, there, you know, back to my force plate data thing, there's a piece of technology that we're experimenting with that if I'm 
I don't think I'm wrong, but I'm happy to be wrong. I'm happy to be proven wrong, uh, but I would love not to be, <laughs> is that um, it will change that force plate data. And it's not because it's being a spring. That's, again, complete nonsense. But it is doing something else that no one's ever thought to do before. I, I, there's a company that's making this product for us. I've been talking to them about it for, geez, 11, 12 years. Um, and we're actually doing the opposite of what everyone thinks you need to do with any sort of embedded technology. Um, anyway, be that as it may, since that's not available now, here's the answer for your daughter. Get out of those spikes as quickly as you can and wear things like our shoes that are going to build strength and help you with active recovery. So basically you're just in the spike, you know, if she's a, uh, is she a hundred meter, 110 meter hurdler or doing the four? Four, 400 mostly. Yeah. There's nothing I would like to do less than that. Um, it takes all the pain and agony of the 400 meters and just ramps it up by a factor of 10. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, so basically get out of those shoes as quickly as you can after that minute ish that she's running, um, and just get back into something that lets your feet spread, relax, build up strength, et cetera. So you can tolerate it. Here's a funny version of that. A surgical podiatrist friend, she published a, an ebook, I think it was called Catwalk Confidential, something like that, or Catwalk Confidence. And the whole idea was how women can tolerate being in high heels. And it was just a foot exercise program. So you could build your feet strong enough and functional enough so that you can tolerate wearing heels for an evening. Never was about wearing them all the time. And so same idea is, you know, get out of things that are causing a problem as quickly as you can. It's no shock if you even if you watch professional track athletes, just watch how fast they take off their spikes after they're done racing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it, they're they're just they're unbelievable when you look at those things. You just you can't you just they're can't horrible. imagine. Yeah. Well, even even more than horrible, the design is all based on superstition. So the design of the spike plate, the thing that you know is the shape of the shoe that's supposed to give you traction and protection and whatever else, um, the materials and the design were made up and then some guy wins a race and then suddenly everyone's doing it. I mean, it really, there's just no evidence that they're fundamentally better for you than anything. Um, and the only reason people don't run bare feet in bare feet on a track is that track surface, you know, my top speed, uh, now I'm 61. When I first got it tested, it was 23 and a half miles an hour. Now it's like just barely over 20. Um, so that's what happens in 14 years. But um, my top speed, even at, you know, 20, 21 miles an hour, for that short period of time that I hit that, if I did that on a modern track service, my feet would be just bloody stumps by the time I got to the end of the the end of the race. Right. Yeah. So you need something, but but when I run in our warehouse, which is a nice smooth concrete surface, um, I can run in bare feet. It feels totally great. My traction is just as good as anything else. You you mentioned earlier that when uh, that people would actually when they did some barefoot training they would actually get trained in how to barefoot run and uh, years ago I read some of Tom Brown's work who did some Native American training and he talked about you know when you run he did it called called fox running where you'd come down onto your onto the kind of the outside of your fourth and fifth metatarsal come down onto the first and second metatarsal and then your heel hits as a three point landing and you come back out like how how you would run through the woods you would kind of feel you know what's underneath you before you let your foot come down all the way i met a guy when i was the i was the director of player development for the new jersey nets in the nba for a couple of years and there was a guy named johnny newman who was uh he was about 34 years old at the time he wore low top shoes and uh, never get injured. He was never in the training room. Uh, and he got, somebody hit him and he had a contusion from the, from the injury. So we finally came into the, track room, into the, tra in the training room and I got my hands on him and I did all of the rehab. And I put my hands on him and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I touched his muscles in his leg and they were like baby soft. And I was like, I go, I looked at him, I said, you wear low top shoes. And you're 35 years old in the NBA. You don't even tape your feet. He never tapes his feet. I go, how do you do that? Everybody in the NBA is wrapping their feet up, wrapping it, taping up like a cast just to be able to make it through the game. I said, how do you do that? And he goes, well, when I jump, before when I come down, I actually just put my toes, my toes down very gently to see what's underneath there. And then I come back down and I put the rest of the weight on my body. And then I go, I, I never fall all my weight on something that's not stable. And I said, yeah. You have a level of proprioception in your body because that's unheard of. And I think what you're talking about when you wear a shoe that allows your bones of your feet and the muscles and ligaments to do their job, 
you're actually going to not create that level of constant wear and tear and torsional stress that makes the muscles so tight. I worked in the NBA. I actually don't have ligaments in my thumbs anymore because I was working on seven foot legs, with, which were hard as rock to get them to play a game. Yeah. And the idea of what he was such an amazing specimen, I was like, I, it was just mind boggling. I just think, and he was just the most amazing human being, you know, God on and off the court, just an amazing human. But that was an example, I think, of what you're actually kind of oh, yeah. talking about is that it <clears throat> changes your musculature. Um, a, absolutely. And I've got to, and there are a couple of things. We got a bunch of NBA guys we're working with right now who are losing their minds with what we're doing with them. Secondly, <clears throat> this, th this pattern you're describing going from supination, the outside of your foot touching first into flat footedness and a little bit of pronation when you come off, that's normal. And the easy proof is if you're sitting in a chair, just lift your knee off the ground and let your foot just relax. And you'll notice that the outside of your foot is lower than the inside of your foot. That's right. the way you're supposed to land. It's not rocket science. You'll notice that your toe is lower than your heel. That's the way you're supposed to land. You want proof? Step on a book like, you know, an inch high and just step off the book and see how you naturally land. You're not going to land on your heel. You're going to land very quickly outside, rolling into the inside. Your heel comes down last. That's normal. We have a WNBA player who contacted us years ago. She said, I'm wearing your sandals off the court and my feet and ankles have become indestructible. You guys need to make a basketball shoe. Well, we at the time had taken one of our hiking boots and turned it into something like one of the original, like the original Air Jordan, which if you watch the movie Air about Michael Jordan, and the Air Jordan, when they give Michael the shoe, they say something like this. We know you like to be lower to the ground, so we're going to make that thinner for you. So he was already because that, that shoe was basically the Chuck Taylors that people wore up until the early 70s. Were not they were a little too thick and a little too narrow, but they were basically a minimalist shoe. So, um, so what you described is exactly right. I had a I was at a chiropractic conference, and the guy running it said to the other chiropractors, "If you have to pay Sashin five bucks for him to let you feel his feet, do it because you'll never feel anything like it. They're crazy flexible, crazy strong, and basically still kind of flat because that's mostly genetic, but." Um, but what we're seeing from athletes is exactly that same thing. Uh, backing up, uh, I mentioned Dr. Irene Davis before. I was on a panel discussion with guys from Brooks and Adidas, and she says to them, in the 70s, you know, we were running in thin-soled running shoes and playing basketball in Chuck Taylors. We weren't seeing the kind of injuries, the severity of injuries, or the number of injuries we've seen ever since you guys came out with you know, the modern athletic shoe. What problem were you trying to solve, and why didn't it work? Dead silence. But this is what, you know, Irene, if you look in the, if you look in PubMed, which is the repository of all medical research, and you look for research about running related injuries, you basically don't find anything prior to about 1976 because it wasn't happening because people were running in shoes that looked like this. They were doing what you described of using their feet naturally, which means they're using their muscles, ligaments, and tendons naturally. And they just weren't having those problems. You ask um, guys from like the Stanford Running Club from the 60s, what'd you guys do when you got injured? And they literally say things like, what? We had legs of steel. We never got injured. You meet Arthur Lydiard, the most successful running coach in history, I would argue. He was from New Zealand. He trained more runners who won Olympic and national and world championship titles in everything from the 800 meters to the marathon, which is an also unheard of thing for a coach to be that ver versatile. His runners never got injured until, and because he made them shoes that looked like ours, and he had them doing a lot of running in bare feet. Then these runners got sponsored by big shoe companies. Injury, 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 injury. There's one here in Boulder. Um, I won't mention by name. Former multi-time world champion and Olympic medalist. Never had an injury until she got a Nike sponsorship. Wow, wow. So going back to the regular. Folk, the pre people listening to the show are probably not sprinters or runner or runners <laughs> even. They just want to get a shoe that actually helps them biomechanically, not get hip pain, not get knee pain, not not yeah. you know degenerate over time. Talk to me about that. What shoe would you recommend, and and mm -hmm. and how does that work? So again, I am not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet. I was a pre med, so the fact that I can say I'm not a doctor makes my parents very sad to this day. Um, so. Uh, I can't promise that you will, you know, have something happen to you um, that will benefit you in ways that you imagine, because I'm not legally allowed to do that because we don't have a study done with our shoes that talks about some of these things. Uh, if you believe in anecdotal information, we have, I think, I don't know, well over 70,000 reviews from people who might say things that 
will suggest that there's a possibility if they had some experience, you might as well. Um, that's the best I can say. So it almost doesn't make a difference in terms of what shoe to pick because, again, the DNA is the same. So we like to say, just take a look at the website, see what you what catches your eye or what you need. If you're hiking, um, you're going to want something with a different tread than if you're just walking around your house in a slipper, for example. That's the biggest range I can think of. We literally do have a couple of little house slippers that ironically uh, people are using for way more than that. They're walking in it. They're doing mild knocking in it. They're do people take shoes and they do things that are, let's say, way off label. And the first shoe we made was a casual canvas shoe. And a couple of weeks after we put it out, there's a guy going, hey, here I'm at the top of Kilimanjaro. I was like, what the? All right. I guess that makes sense. So, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, somebody that I know came back from Tibet and Nepal and said, you know, we went up to, to um, Everest base camp and all the Sherpas are climbing either in flip-flops or nothing. And here we are decked out in these $300 shoes and they're fine. At the end of the day, they feel great. We're ripping off our boots and our feet are killing us. What the hell's going on? It's like, yeah, they're doing the thing that's natural. So on the one extreme, you can go for something like one of our house slippers or there's a sprinting shoe that I developed uh, called the Speed Force. That is the closest thing to barefoot in a performance shoe. And then on the other side, <clears throat> On the hiking side is like the Scrambler Mid that you have, or our Excursion Fusion, which is a fully waterproof technical boot, or um, uh, the Ridgeway, which is a retro style technical hiking boot. So we, oh, oh, I should have done the simple answer. On our website, you'll see a link that says something like find your shoe. And that's a little quiz you can take about what you like to do in your shoe and other things. Um, and it'll give you some recommendations. And that would be the easiest thing to do. I would love to say, just go down to fill in the blank store near you and try things on, but we're only in about 300 stores in the in the US. Um, and there's no store that carries our entire product line, of course. Oh, but if you are in or near Denver, then swing by, you just go to our website and go to the contact us page and you'll see where we have our warehouse and there's a store attached to the warehouse. So you can try on everything there and see what you like. When you first had the the, the original Harachi, it's just the rubber kind of rubber sole. You had the Vibram sole, really, really kind of thin. Yeah. Um, and you would just strap that to your foot. And then you created something like this. Um, uh, you know, there's no doubt that I feel the ground when I was hiking with this. I could feel the little rocks, but they were obviously very, very tolerable. And it felt like I could kind of wrap my toes around them. Yeah. When I was wearing those, the just the, the Vibram kind of rubber so you can feel them in a in a way more aggressive manner. So I wonder yes. what your what happened from people feeling almost everything from barefoot. You feel everything from those original shoes you had. You feel a little less here. You feel even a little less, but you're still mm -hmm. getting the same benefit. How right. to help to help me understand how that works? Because I really I really love what you've done. I think you've created something that's really uh, can really go mainstream. But I wonder, did you lose anything along the way? Um, that's, pardon me again, that's the balancing act in, in what we're doing is we want to encourage and engender natural movement first and foremost, your toes can spread, your feet can bend and flex, et cetera. Then after that, we want to have as little protection as we can get away with, given the use case that you're going to be using the shoe for. So if you are a hiker, it's totally possible to hike in a really thin pair of sandals, just like the Sherpas do, or in nothing. Um, I've done this with a couple of people. We'll go out, you know, outside of Boulder to Mount Sanitas and we'll climb that thing and we're in bare feet and people are looking at us like our, we're crazy. We just learned to pay attention and know where to put your feet and use the environment instead of just try to go over the environment. So in our trail shoes, we built in a tiny little bit of foam just to give you a little bit of protection, just to take the edge off, but still give you enough ground feedback that you're able to adjust and adapt to what you're feeling. That's always the key. If you can't feel enough to, to quickly tell your brain what you need to do next, that's a problem. So we're never going to do that. Um, and again, it's a bit of a balancing act. And there are some people who say, you know, I'd like a little more cushioning. And our response is then go to another company. We're not going to do that because the research is very clear that when you add just, you know, that little bit of extra too much, it's reducing the amount of feedback that you're getting enough that you're, again, it's about form, not footwear. When you have that, when you've reduced that feedback, you're not getting the feedback you need to make those form adjustments. And that's what we want to make sure we're never providing is that kind of uh, reduction in feedback. That was a weird bunch of triple negatives. Sorry about that. 
No, I totally get it. You have to have that feedback. And that's why even when I was wearing this, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. But I could still feel the rocks and the pebbles, yeah. but they were way but comfortable. And I could kind of feel, you know, without having that painful barefoot experience going running on, you know, walking on trails with pebbles and rocks and things. I mean, I don't know how you do that. That's crazy. But that's uh, obviously it's a training effect, right? Well, you just you just learn. People think, oh, you know, your feet get calluses and whatever. It's like, no, no. Uh, there's a number of things that I wish I had done on day one, just to see what the difference is by day, whatever. And one is just checking to see how flexible my feet were and how fast my reflex arc is, because it, things that were difficult to walk on on day one, when I was barefoot now are no problem, not because I have calluses, which I don't, um, calluses come from bad form, frankly, uh, but because my feet are more flexible and I'm just more responsive when I feel something I'm not over and I have better form. I'm not overweighting my foot. I'm not just committing to putting my foot down wherever it lands. Like you said, with the basketball player, I'm putting it down and I'm checking, is that cool or not? And if it is, then I put the rest of my weight on my foot. And if it's not, I lift my foot up and I put it somewhere else. So it's, and it's not a conscious thing. It just happens naturally. So it feels like my reflexes improved and my feet have definitely gotten more flexible and stronger. So you put all that together and, but I wish I had like objective measurements to show that we hear it all the time, but no one has had the resources to, you know, before they put on our shoe, go get a bunch of testing, wait for a couple months and do it again. Right. So do you, do you provide any, um, any education, um, like, you know, how to, how to run where you, you know, supinate, then sort of pronate and then come back yeah. to three point landing. Do you actually have videos and I show people how to actually do um, that? And get <clears> we tips? do, but the simplest thing I can say is the instructions are really easy. Remember, human beings have been doing this since the beginning of human beings. There's no reason that you can't too, whoever you are. But um, if you've been basically not giving your brain feedback for a while, your brain has literally changed its shape because why waste the energy if you're not going to give it something? So it can take a little time to kind of wake up those neural circuits again and for your brain to change back into its natural shape. I know that sounds crazy. There's a book called The Brain That Changes Itself and a doctor named Michael Merzenich talks about exactly this. Um, so, so there might take a little time to wake up the neural pathways again. It also might take a little bit of time to just get used to these new movement patterns because people learn how to move differently in a while. The strength that you're going to build... Think about if you haven't been to the gym for a long time, you don't go back and just pick up where you left off. You reduce the weight, you reduce the sets, you start you know, from being a beginner. Same idea here. So you just want to start slowly and that will let you wake up those neural pathways and start to build that strength without doing too much. So if I was going to give you instructions for running, I'd say take off your shoes, find a really smooth, hard surface because that's going to give you the most feedback. Grass is a bad idea. It's kind of cushioned and also undulates. I can't sprint on the grass because there's going to be a little divot somewhere, a little point that's a little higher. And you step on that when you're going at full speed and it messes up your gait and you can hit the hit your face on the ground. So um, smooth, hard surface, go for a really short run, like 20 seconds, and then see how you feel the next day. If you feel great, cool. Add another 10 seconds the next time. If you feel a little muscular soreness, also okay, then wait till you feel better and then do that 20 seconds again until you can do it and you just feel like you want to keep going, then add just a little bit. If you feel like you hurt something, then you're going to want to get a little more instruction about what you might want to do differently. And the instructions for walking or running couldn't be simpler. You want to land with your foot underneath your body as much as possible. Don't worry about landing on the outside of your foot or the inside of your foot or flat foot or whatever. If you're landing with your foot underneath you, that's going to take care of 99% of it. People ask about walking. They go, do I land on my forefoot, my midfoot? Do I land flat foot? I go, you're going to land wherever you're going to land, whether you're going uphill, downhill, fast or slow, accelerating, decelerating, that's going to change. But if you're getting your foot underneath you, that's going to be the important part. Because then if you do that, you're going to be using your glutes and hamstrings properly also. Same thing with running. If you're extending your foot and landing with your foot way out in front of you, you're putting on the brakes every time you land. You want to not put on the brakes, get your feet underneath you, and the rest will take care of itself. And yes, we do instructional stuff. So that sounds, I think that would sound scary for a lot of people to go on a hard concrete surface and just run on that as fast as they could right off the bat. I'm not, or, I'm not saying run as fast as you could. I'm saying run. whatever pace you're doing, just you know, go for a little run. And if that feels like too much, cool. Just walk to the mailbox or back, walk down the street or yeah. back. Again, smooth, hard surface is not going to be painful. The surface won't be painful. You're just worried that it's going to be hurting. But again, 
if you land with your feet underneath you, you'll be using your muscles, ligaments, and tendons as the natural springs and shock absorbers that are meant to be. You won't feel, I mean, all I can say is try it for 20 seconds and see what happens. Okay. Again, if it feels in any, the, actually the last instruction I gave is if it hurts, do something until you're having fun. Use fun as the guideline. You can spot a barefoot runner from 50 yards away. They have this really weird look on their face. I think you call it, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, smiling. Um, they're, you know, they're looking like they're having a good time and that's the way it is. And so use fun as a guideline. If you're not having fun, change something up. If it feels like you hurt something, then, you know, ask for some instruction, have someone videotape you, you know, have, you can send videos to us. We'll take a look at them. It's not hard. Just remember, this is what we are meant to do. What's the proof? Watch kids. Look at little kids when they're just starting to run. They, and they're not, they haven't been in regular shoes. Again, they have that weird smiley thing on their face. They're usually laughing, actually. They have the perfect little butt of lean from their ankles. They're kind of leaning a little forward. They're they're not, they're lifting their feet off the ground. They're putting their feet right underneath their center of mass. They do it till they're done. Then they sit down and goof around and then they get back up and run some more. If it's not like that, you're doing something wrong. And what happens if you watch these kids, once they start getting into regular shoes, that all goes away. Their form changes. They're not having fun. It becomes a chore. Even worse, if you're in a gym class in elementary school where, or, a, or a sport where they make you run as punishment, it's like, oh, go do a lap because you just disobeyed me. Now you're learning that running is supposed to be painful. I mean, what the hell is that all about? What happened to the part where it was fun? What happened to the part? Just remember yourself being a kid. When you go out on a warm summer day, you kick off your shoes, you feel the grass underneath your feet, you feel the, or the sand beneath your toes or the water around your ankles, depending on where you are. You can have that now. You can have that all the time. I mean, we make shoes that are good for hiking and for water. We go on hikes where people are trying to figure out how to cross this little stream without getting their feet wet. And we're just like tromping through the water because it feels great. And then the shoes like dry out instantly. So if you're not having fun, something is wrong. And I'm going to argue that it's going to start with your shoes. Yeah, that's a great point. I wrote an article years ago about kind of the fox running technique. And I was trying to get pictures of myself doing it really, really well. And it <clears throat> wasn't going very well. <laughs> so I had my five, six-year-old daughter, or maybe she was seven or I can't, somewhere around about five, seven. And I had her do it and I did it. And I, and I started taking pictures of her and it was like unbelievable. Just exactly what you said. She was doing it perfectly. I didn't even tell her how to do it or anything. I said, just run. And I was like, oh my God, it was just, you know, the feet were going one right in front of another. They were running in a straight line, which was just beautiful. Coming down on the outside, coming down. <clears throat> and there's pictures on my... <clears throat> On my website at lifespot.com, you can search up that that article. Maybe we'll link it, and you can kind of look at the pictures of her feet. They're just gorgeous how she was yeah. running, and and I think it is something that is absolutely quite natural. I think that people, if they did a hard, smooth surface, they would probably maybe maybe this is a good thing. Go right into sort of a toe running version because they didn't want to hit their heel. Obviously, there's no padding there, right? And that's yeah. sort of what you're looking for. That would be the effect. It would yeah. all of a sudden switch from a heel toe runner to doing something midfoot. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, landing on your heel in bare feet hurts. But the one thing that I want to talk to people about, I'll never forget the first time I saw this, is people hear, oh, you're supposed to land on the ball of your foot. And so they still reach out with their foot way out in front of them and then point their toes to land on the ball of your foot. That's the fastest way to get a metatarsal sprain or, or break because you're putting a lot of force on your foot in a way that isn't actually engaging the arch and the, uh, the musculature to give you the protective features that you actually need. So again, the key is getting your foot underneath you as much as humanly possible. And if you do those two things, if you're in bare feet or our shoes, frankly, but especially bare feet and you get your feet underneath you, it's almost impossible to land on your heel, just like kids, it, because you're just aligned in a way. If you lean just a tiny bit forward, it, you just can't do it. If you're running, walking, you can still land on your heel-ish. Um, if you think about your heel as being a ball, there's different places on that ball you could land. If you're landing, you know, um, imagine, I'm trying to think of how to describe this. Basically, if you land on the back of your heel, that's different than landing sort of on the bottom of your heel as your foot is rolling forward. If you're really getting your feet underneath you, your, your heel is just barely there. It's you're hitting the bottom of it and it's rolling quickly to your midfoot rather than having your foot in front of you where you're slamming the back of your heel into the ground and crossing your fingers that you have some protection for that. So, um, I mean, there, it's again, the number one thing is just getting your foot underneath you. That's going to take care of most issues. And after that, the only thing after that is playing with your cadence. If you're running in particular, 
number of steps per minute, because what people tend to do is they want to land on the ground rather than having their foot like barely touch the ground as if your, your feet are on a wheel where it's just like barely touching the ground and coming right off the ground is sort of the image to use. And the easiest way to, to mm, affect both of these, actually to even get your feet landing underneath you a little more is to pick up the number of steps per minute you have when you're running just a little bit, like five or 10, you know, faster steps per minute without running faster. So you're just, you know, spinning your wheels a little bit, but what that does is you can't keep your foot on the ground as long. And so one of the first adjustments your brain makes is you don't reach out in front of you as much, if at, if at all. So play with your cadence as well. Don't run faster. Just move your legs a little faster. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a wheel like this. Yeah. 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 I, I yeah. like to think, I like to think of two things. I like to think, how can I lift my foot off the ground before I'm even hitting the ground? So I'm kind of prepared for pulling it off the ground. And the way I pull it off the ground isn't by pushing with my toes. It's um, the image that I like to use. It's a horrible image is imagine getting stung by a bee. You don't push your foot off the ground. That would put the stinger further in your foot. You reflexively lift your foot off the ground by flexing your hip. Or another way of thinking it is you're lifting your knee off the ground by flexing your hip. So that's the, in the impetus, the impulse is you want to think that your foot is going to come off the ground before it even hits the ground. And what's making it come off the ground is lifting it by flexing your hip a little bit. You're still going to use your foot and your ankle and your calf, but less. It, the, the other, I guess this is becoming more complicated than I thought started with. The idea is you want to, you're going to be doing, uh, focusing more on relaxing and using less effort than on trying to get stronger and having, you know, some sort of no pain, no gain mentality. Hmm. Amazing. I, you know, I love your work. I hope everybody, you know, goes to your website, checks it out. There's a link below. Um, I really think this is uh, so important. I love how your company's evolved to make this, you know, really practical for everybody, for every situation to use these shoes. It's a, you know, I want to get one for every kind of thing I do, you know, because it's yeah. such, such a beautiful uh, idea. Because I really do feel like the, the slow um, <clears throat> accumulative biomechanics are going to help you all of us in the long run, because gravity at the end of the day wins out, you know, it takes all of us out and <clears throat> we were designed to handle it way better than we are with the shoes we wear and the things we do for sure. Yeah. You know, backing up to um, talking about basketball players, these guys have amazing sensitivity about their feet, even if they've been in stupid ass basketball shoes that don't let them feel anything and move properly. Because when we put our shoes on them, they they all tend to use the same language to describe what they're experiencing, which is really fun. Every like over fifty percent of the ball players that we put shoes on, they say, "Oh my god, I feel like I'm using my whole foot now." I mean, that wasn't even a phrase that I thought of, but Jesus, is that brilliant. But that's what's happening. That before, with an elevated heel, you're not using your foot properly. Now they're going, "I'm feeling my whole foot. My toes are spreading." I feel like my favorite line is um, what. Um, uh, the WNBA player said with our basketball shoe, I couldn't sprain my ankle in these if you paid me to, because we're low to the ground. And so, you know, you're cutting back and forth. You're not putting yourself in a position where you're, the higher you get off the ground, the tippier you are, the, the worse your balance is. I mean, it's really that simple. And so keeping them low, letting their feet function, letting them bend and flex and move, they're hypersensitive to this stuff. And it's been so much fun working with these guys. In in part, I will confess, because I do not follow basketball at all. So I don't know who they are. And so we just have a lot of fun because they've never met anyone who treats them just like some just tall version of another human being. And so we, I, I just, I make fun of them and they make fun of me and we have a good time. And then, you know, we go out and watch them perform better. Yeah, <clears throat> no, it's wonderful. I think, you know, I worked on a lot of NBA feet and I got to tell you, they're not good. They're hard There's as rock. It is oh. just, uh, they really need something like this. And I think, and track athletes, I think the same and, and just, you know, all of us do because over time, you know, athletes feel it right away, but most of us who aren't competitive athletes, or, you know, just living life, we feel it look, over time. Look, I, I, um, I say this and some people get mad at me because I say this without, um, without getting all teary eyed in part because uh, this event happened eight years ago or nine years ago. Uh, my dad was one of those guys who over time, just, you know, big thick shoes and, never really felt his feet and tripped over a tiny, tiny little thing, had bad balance, couldn't figure out how to catch himself, fell down, uh, broke his hip and died two weeks later. This is a very, very common thing. It's a, it is like you said, cumulative. And Matt here, oh crap, I forgot to mention this. Uh, uh, research from, from Katrina Protopapas and others showed that just putting arch support in the shoes of healthy individuals reduced their strength and muscle mass in their feet by up to 17% in 12 weeks. 
imagine how that gets con continues to get worse over time. It never goes to zero, of course, but it gets asymptotically close. You know, it builds weak, unresponsive feet. When is weaker better than stronger? Good answer, never. That's amazing because that's the first thing. I'm sure you get that question all the time. Why are there no arch supports in your shoes? I can tell you why. Want to hear why? Yeah, this of course. Okay, so the modern athletic shoe, um, the first, the, the way it happened was in the early days of Nike, Bill Bowerman was sharing a building with some sports podiatrists, maybe orthopedic podiatrists, I can't remember. And he came down saying, I'm getting these new runners. They're getting Achilles tendonitis. What do you recommend? And the guy said, the doctor said, well, clearly their Achilles have shortened from wearing higher heel dress shoes. And so you need to you know, accommodate that by making a higher heel running shoe. So pick up, put like a wedge of foam in there. By the way, cut to 30 years later, when one of these doctors is at a track meet with a friend of mine, a guy who worked directly with Bowerman for decades, and my friend who I've designed a couple of shoes with, the guy I'm working on the spike with, um, he said, uh, what do you think about the fact that your idea has become used by every footwear brand in the world for the last 50 years? And he said, the doctor said, um, biggest mistake we ever made. Wow. We we didn't had no evidence for either the cause or the cure of this issue. So cut, cutting back. So they put this wedged heel in a shoe. When you put a wedged heel in a shoe, I'm not going to get into all the details, we don't have time, but basically, even if you at that time you were running perfectly, the wedge heel gets in the way of your perfect running form. And instead of landing with your foot underneath you, the shoe hits the ground in front of your body. Just the math of how your body was already moving. Now something is getting in the way. Your heel is a ball. So if you land on your heel with it in front of your body, you're unstable. <clears throat> so the shoe companies quickly figured this out and they said, oh, we got to build in motion control because, quote, you pronate or you supinate. Yeah, you do that because the shoe makes you do that because you have no control when you land on a ball about where you're going to roll. So then they tried to build in motion control, which, by the way, also doesn't work because the amount of force you hit the ground with, there's nothing you can put underneath your foot that's going to keep you, I mean, certainly nothing cushioned that will keep you from having pronation or supination. Maybe a tiny bit, it might do something, but barely anything. Okay, so now you have motion control. But the other thing that happens when you land on, the, on your heel out in front of your body is by the time your foot hits the ground, it's basically flat. Now, here's where I have to move to another part of your body. Imagine doing bicep curls. So the amount of weight you can lift if I started with your arm at 90 degrees is much higher than you can lift when your arm is fully extended. Your arm is stronger at 90 degrees than it is when it's fully extended at 180 degrees. Same thing with your feet. If you land on the ball of your foot, all of the bones in your, well, there's a thing called the windlass mechanism that helps align the bones in your foot, all the muscles in your plantar and ligaments and tendons, your plantar fascia are basically there to be strong. They're like your bicep being, your arm being at 90 degrees to do a bicep curl. If your plantar fascia are fully extended when your foot comes down flat, you're asking your plantar fascia to be strong when they're in the weakest position. So then they built in arch support because that was causing plantar, because the, the, the force in a weak position was causing plantar fasciitis. So they built in arch support so you don't need to use your arches. Now, not using it feels good, just like sitting down on a good chair feels good because you're not using your muscles, ligaments, and tendons. When is that ever good? Guys mm. come back from space not using their muscles, ligaments, and tendons. They need to go into the gym before they can even walk like normal human beings again. So same thing happens again, up to 17% muscle wasting in just 12 weeks when you don't let your body do what it's meant to do to stay strong. So that's where it came from was it was the third intervention to try to fix a problem that the shoe created to begin with. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. I'm so happy to have you back on my radar, Stephen. You know, I, my daughter's been struggling. She ended up with two metatarsal fractures, a cyst in her navicular, you know, and all because I really believe because she, she, you know, she's a little bit of a toe runner, but I think those arch supports probably just kind of just made that worse. And it just worse. And, and look, I, I'll confess for hurdlers, it gets challenging because there's times where, you know, if you're not clearing the hurdle well enough, you're going to land on the ball of your foot with it in front of your body. But the question yeah. is, are you then strong enough to handle that? Cause you've been doing all this other work. So yeah. um, there's, I mean, I, I just, I watch it all the time with hurdlers and steeplechase uh, runners. It's you know, the tire, more tired you get, the less control you have. It's just yeah. the way it is. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing work. I love your company. Again, the link Thank below, you know, go to his website, check it out, find the shoe that you like, 
buy a couple really because you, you want a pair for your running and you know, he's got an awesome like winter shoe now that you can go hiking in the snow i thought that was amazing looking shoe you know it's crazy some really beautiful designs too thank you Stephen, for what you're doing thanks for coming on and i wish you the greatest success pleasure john thank you so much you bet do you like this video don't forget to subscribe and share this recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.